want to begin by commending you for your commitment to independent research and for meeting the challenge of completing an honors project. I hope you'll experience this day as a time to savor and celebrate your accomplishments, as well as to admire and be inspired by the work of others. Her presentation is entitled, Graveyards and Ghosts, Death of the Coral Reefs, an Interdisciplinary Examination of the Socioeconomic Repercussions of the World's Diminishing Coral Reefs. Let's give a warm welcome. The death of an ecosystem may arguably be one of the most gut-wrenching natural events to witness. In what seems like a blink of an eye, we are losing species and habitats at an alarming rate, with many of Earth's ecosystems currently in a critical state of stress, and our coral reefs are no exception. Climate change and anthropogenic aggressors are taking a serious toll on one of Earth's most precious ecosystems. For many people, corals are out of sight and out of mind. They often have a loose grasp of what a coral actually is. Is it a rock? Is it an animal? <laughs> And this drove me to want to examine how humans are connected to coral reefs and how this information can be presented in a way that makes people care about something that they may never see in their lives. Looking at the degradation of the coral reefs from this perspective allowed me to examine some really poignant questions. What is unique about coral reef ecosystems and what will the biological impact of their loss be? How are we dependent on coral reefs and what are the potential socioeconomic impacts? And lastly, how are we responsible? With an examination of the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef in the Caribbean, known as the MBR, and the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, known as the GBR, I'll explore whether or not we're left with much hope for this natural wonder and what we can learn from this tragedy. Coral is one of the most simple and one of the most complex organisms on Earth. Its most basic structure is uh -oh, the polyp. <laughs> These simple little benthic creatures are comprised mostly of just a mouth and stinging little tentacles that allow them to snag passing food that floats by at night. Collectively, these polyps form colonies that are known as corals. There are about a thousand species of reef-building corals who continue to build on top of their exoskeletons until they form substantially large structures known as reefs. But the most unique feature of coral is the symbiotic relationship it has with the microalgae that gives it its vibrant colors. This microalgae, known as zooxanthellae, photosynthesizes during the day, providing a huge portion of the coral's nutrient base and allowing it to essentially feed around the clock. Corals are found in almost every ocean of the world, but it's the corals of the tropic and subtropic waters that form reefs. The water near the equator is warm and nutrient depleted due to the lack of upwelling, making it difficult for anything else to live here. But corals have adapted to the very specific conditions of this environment, turning them into an underwater oasis that attracts thousands of other animals. Coral reefs are one of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. Covering less than 1%, they're home to over 5,000 species. 25% of all marine life spends some portion of its life cycle on the reef, which is also one of the oldest ecosystems. Portions of the GBR date back to 25 million years ago. In fact, the GBR is also the single largest formation ever formed by a creature on our planet. But not only is a huge portion of all marine life dependent on coral reefs, humans have benefited from their ecological services as well. They offer extensive shoreline protection in tropical regions. Their large structures absorb much of the force of incoming waves during large storms. Regions like the Caribbean rely heavily on this during their hurricane season. Estimates have been made that without the protection of the MBR, damages could total up to $420 million per year. 93,000 miles of coast in over 100 countries receive protection from coral reefs many of these being developing nations. In terms of sustenance and livelihood, the corals are a source of food and income for more than 500 million people. This means that we're not only facing an ecological crisis with their loss, but we're facing a potential humanitarian and geopolitical crisis when half a billion people are out of food and jobs. 
Sustainable reef fishery benefit the global net market by $5.7 million per year. Recreation and tourism, another $9.6 billion. And estimates have been made that the total net benefit of the world's coral reef ecosystems comes to $29.8 billion annually. These numbers are astounding, and yet monetary value doesn't even begin to encompass the entirety of their socioeconomic value. They've been referred to as the medicine cabinets of the 21st century. Bioprospecting, the search for new pharmaceuticals, hasn't reached its full potential in marine environments. And yet, we've already discovered chemical compounds that have aided in the treatment of human bacterial infections, arthritis, and cancer. Cultural heritage is important to the indigenous people of coastal regions. For the Torres Strait Islander people of Australia, the GBR plays an important role in traditions, ceremonies, and their ancestral relationship to the ocean. Again, a monetary value can't be assigned, and yet these factors and aspects are intimately related to how we connect to the world that we live in. Now, in order for me to understand the repercussions of this loss, I had to really delve deeper into understanding exactly what is happening and the active role that we're playing in this extinction. By now we know that we're living through one of Earth's periods of climate change. The geological record indicates that this is a pattern of behavior for our planet, alternately warming and cooling over long periods of time. But this is the first time that a species is expediting that process. The way that we as humans live, produce, and power our planet is driving climate change to occur at an overwhelming pace, particularly with the burning of fossil fuels. Evidence of these effects are being seen in many of Earth's processes, but few are as telling as the impacts that we're seeing in the Earth's oceans, which are literally taking the brunt of the beating. Ocean temperatures have already spiked a little over a full degree Celsius. Sea levels are rising due to the melting of our polar ice, and the oceans are becoming more acidic with the retention of CO2. All of these are manifesting themselves in a variety of destructive mechanisms that are killing our corals before our very eyes. Ocean acidification spells disaster for any marine species with a calcium carbonate structure, as it actually reverses the calcification process. 37% of the MBR is already net eroding. In Hawaii and Florida, rising sea levels are drowning corals, who need that shallow water for their zooxanthellae to photosynthesize. Intensified storm systems are shredding our reefs like chew toys leaving behind wounded tissue and dead skeletons. All of these are depressing, and yet we still haven't addressed the most visible, the most devastating of all climate change effects, the phenomena of coral bleaching. Bleaching occurs when sea temperatures rise, causing the zooxanthellae to release toxins. And in a state of panic, the coral purges itself of its microalgae, leaving it with nothing but its eerie white exoskeleton. Without the microalgae, the coral begins to starve, leaving it vulnerable to predators and disease. Now, the coral isn't dead yet. If given enough time, it could make a full recovery. For some, this takes 10 years. For others, 40. But bleaching is occurring at a higher frequency, and our corals don't have the time that they need. Bleaching has affected every coral reef on our planet at this point. <coughs> 1998 was the first time that we saw it on a mass scale, and scientists were baffled. Never before had we seen an event like this that occurred in multiple regions simultaneously. That year, 80% of the corals in the Indian Ocean bleached, and ultimately 20% died. In 2005, 80% of the MBR bleached, and 40% died. But currently receiving media attention are the most recent episodes of bleaching on the GBR, which have occurred back to back for the last three years now. As one of the seven wonders of the world, the GBR is a beloved treasure and we're watching it die. The most devastating episode in 2016 hit the northern portion of the reef the hardest. 91% of the corals bleached, and in segments here, the mortality rate was as high as 83%. According to Australia's 2016 Outlook report, more than 70,000 people are employed because of the GBR, which contributes $5.6 billion to the Australian economy. The economy here will take one of the largest hits. Now, keep in mind that all I've really detailed are the effects of human-driven climate change, which are by no means the only way in which we are jeopardizing the coral reefs. 
water pollution, over sedimentation from development, boating, fishing. These are just a few more that I can name. Each of these is a dire threat on their own, and yet together they magnify and inflate one another until the results are devastating. We're left with the grim reality that many estimates place the wholesale loss of our coral reefs as inevitable by 2050. Now, I'm gonna be honest, the state of our reefs is very disheartening. We're left wondering if we have much hope. Some countries have initiated emergency conservation plans, but there's concerns that there'll be a delay in results. The GBR was listed as a protected and endangered ecosystem back in 1981, but it took until 2015 for Australia to develop and implement its Reef 2050 plan, which sets out to implement cleaner water practices and development, and yet somehow manages to completely ignore the fact that Australia is one of the world's largest coal exporters. Addressing one and not the other will not be enough. Other countries, such as the developing islands of the Caribbean, lack funding. Reef Resilience Network estimates that over half of the protein consumed by the population here is supplied by the reefs, and that more than 300,000 people are employed in reef fisheries. And yet, with help global aid, they'll find it difficult to implement any large-scale initiatives. We also know that money isn't always enough. Cutting CO2 emissions and cleaning our oceans may buy us a few more decades, but the continued warming of our planet is inevitable, and the effects on our corals will continue. Instead, researchers are beginning to focus on how they can nudge corals in the right evolutionary direction. Marine biologists, such as Dr. Kristen Marhaber of the Canberra Institute in the Caribbean, are studying the viability of corals grown in labs and floating nurseries, and the success rates of grafting them onto damaged reefs. They're also studying the species that seem to be a little more resistant to the current threats. Dr. Marhaber is adamant that with the use of genetic modification, we could help shift corals' preferences to deeper, cooler waters, farther out from the pollution of shores. But the key factor is time, and we don't know if we have enough. So do we begin writing the obituary for the coral reefs? That's a loaded question. While the majority of the literature expresses hope, Many scientists argue that it's too late. The damage has been done. I set out in this project to exclusively examine the socioeconomic repercussions of this loss by poring over government fiscal reports. I didn't expect to spend hours thinking and talking to anybody who would listen to me about how if this is gonna be a reality, if we're gonna witness this in our lifetimes, then what do we learn? One of the most disturbing themes that I came across over and over again in my research was this need to quantify loss in terms of how it would affect us directly. The extinction of thousands of species didn't seem to be enough. A monetary value had to be attached to the coral reefs in order for governments around the world to get involved. I fear that we have lost our ability to empathize with our planet. And I fear that we will continue to fail in preserving other precious and vulnerable environments until we're able to consider how these losses impact something other than our own well-being. John Hammond, the fictional creator of Jurassic Park, aptly quips in the novel, these creatures require our absence to survive, not our help. And this has long since resonated with me. For all of our meddling and well-doing, also caused a tremendous amount of harm. Based on the statistics that I presented today, you can see that the wholesale loss of our coral reefs will be devastating the world over. Economies may crash, entire shorelines will be destroyed, and people will starve. The humanitarian and economic crises that ensue will affect half a billion people around the globe, and we are in no way prepared to respond on that scale. We have no contingency plan. But I believe that it is just as important to note that if we lose this ecosystem forever, it may be considered one of our greatest failures in conservation by allowing the continued commercial exploitation of an ecosystem that we had pledged to save. We are just one of an incredible number of species, mere adolescents in terms of our time here on Earth, and yet we are the guardians of this beautifully diverse planet. 
we have a responsibility, a role to perform in our symbiotic relationship with Earth to effectively protect what all species call home. Or there may come a day when home is no longer safe for us. Thank you. And I'm going to leave it up to you to, to raise your hand and you guys to, to answer them um, and, and address whomever you would like to. Does anybody have any questions for us? <laughs> yes? Uh, for you, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Heather, that's okay. Heather. Um, have the previous cycles of um, warming and cooling on our planet affected the um, size or even the uh, livelihood of corals before? And um, how much different is this um, human intervention then? Um, that's a great question. Corals actually leave growth rings just like trees do. And so we're able to see any critical events that happen during a specific year. They lay these rings every year. And so looking back when we pull core samples of older reefs, we're able to see these periods of warming and cooling, ocean acidification, calcification, deterioration, things like that. The difference is, is those processes previously occurred over a time span of thousands of years, which allowed the corals time to adapt. They were able to survive these, these periods that were sometimes mass extinctions for other species because they had the time to adapt. Um, we're seeing this huge rise in CO2 emissions that has risen steadily over the course of the last 100 years, and our corals don't have that time they need. Um, so I have a question for Heather. Uh, you said Dr. Marhager, um, one of the things that she uh, proposed as, you know, an answer to this was to make coral that can survive in deeper, cooler waters. Um, my question would be, what would happen to, you know, the, the ecosystem that's already there in these deeper, cooler waters? Uh, is that that's an excellent question. So never in the history of our attempts of conservation have we ever attempted to transplant an entire ecosystem to another location. We have no precedent. Uh, we have no idea how it will interact with an ecosystem that's already in place, how it will change the ecology of the species and their interaction with one another, whether or not the species on either end would even be able to survive it. Um, unfortunately, that's going to be a giant experiment with our ocean as our laboratory, um, which got, has its own ethical and moral um, discussions and philosophies behind it, but we don't know. We have no idea because we've never attempted it. Can I piggyback off of that question because that's kind of the area. I was thinking though more of the um, the protection the coral reefs so if you do do that do you not take away that that area of protection because they are not going to grow beyond that that lower level so do we not have that still that that concern of the economic crisis of the um, the breakdown of, of the damage that would be done that the coral reef does protect yeah exactly well we have no idea whether or not the corals would be successful in the new environment um, that's going to take a lot of time to figure out. Just because you transplant them and maybe they live, will they grow? Will they continue to reproduce? We don't know. Um, and so that has a whole snowball effect down the chain of socioeconomic issues. Also, there's the issue of if we transplant this entire ecosystem, what happens to the local indigenous cultures who rely heavily on this for their traditional fishing grounds? Do they have the technology to be able to fish farther offshore? For some cultures, the answer to that's going to be no. Um, for others, maybe. Can they adapt to that? We don't know. And that's, that's kind of a really scary process leading to that, let's try to move them. Because that can have repercussions on a broader scale, I think, than we're even aware of. Um, so one more question for Heather. Um, so you said that we, we failed in conservation of 
this ecosystem, obviously. Um, but can you be more specific in um, how? how? How did we fail? And what can we do differently moving forward? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a super valid question. I basically say we failed in this conservation and I offer no alternative. <laughs> um, so I was really hoping somebody would ask me this. A um, couple of the issues that I have with our current models for conservation, and these are the current models being used on ecosystems like the GBR, the rainforest, um, our Arctic regions, um, is first of all, our history says that we exploit, exploit, exploit. This is our MO until we start to run out and then we get scared and we go, oh no, we should save it. That's a problem and it's a pattern of behavior for us. Uh, we have systematically gone through every ecosystem, every natural resource in this exact same mannerism. Um, and so, so that's my first issue with the conservation attacks. My second is that the most standard model for conservation targets, I'm sorry, it chooses target species to be saved. Um, they assume that you cannot save the entire ecosystem, and we're going to pick these 10 most important species that we need to save. But if you really, really look and you really read between the lines, these 10 important species are some of the most commercially exploited species. We're looking at oysters, we're looking at tropical fish that are popular in the tropical aquarium industry, which is a million dollar industry, or billion dollar industry. Um, these are the species that are targeted because it's assumed these are the species we need the most. I would argue that that is not true conservation. A true holistic conservation attempt would attempt to save 100% of the species and that is not typically our goal. Thank you. Let's give all three presenters a